deal with and we kept going to the council asking them to come in to sort this out and let us go from one house to another house. We even offered a uh, why don't you buy us a flat, the same type of flat as what I was in and they refused. Uh, that's just the way it was. Every time we went for, we got a letter sent, we contacted them to see the guy who dealt with, or oh, he's off from the sick, he's away on holiday, he's away in another department, and that's just the way they do it in Pulse of Purchase. They just keep passing the buck one from one hit to, to another. And they leave you sitting to, as I say, I was the last one, and that was, it was just horrendous. And even at the time I'm coming in, uh, to put us out, they came to put me, my sister, my brother, and my man and my nephew. They were only five in the house. They knew they were only five in the house because they had infrared cameras and they could tell many people was in the house. What you did not see at the eviction was they came with Valley Carver in masks. They pulled the power out and they kept my sons and supporters that was out. At. They, a lot of the supports were people from Domarno who, who were there trying to help us. And it was just horrendous what they done and to happen in the 21st century, them coming in the way they came in was unbelievable. And it could have been all been resolved. But as I say, it wasn't just me, there were five shop owners and they're the same. They're still sitting, they lost their businesses and they've not had any money. We've all been put, I've been put out in my house nothing, I'm still homeless. The businesses, uh, is the, the local councillor, you heard him there saying, my local councillor, Mr. Redman, told me to take it in the chin because the cotton milk games for, for the good of the area. Uh, but then all his family were sitting in their nice wee back and front doors and I was told I wasn't entitled to a, a back and front door. I was told I was to get my compensation and go and buy this. Then when the council came and we were getting to court, they came in and they said they will give you temporary accommodation and I was to pay £400 a month for it, but it would only be temporary for 12 weeks because it was a, a homeless, a homeless a flat and they've got to turn them over within a period of 12 weeks. So I would have been in it for 12 weeks and then in 12 weeks I would have been back out in the street again. And I had to prove to the council that the CPO they were, I, I decided that, that day when they decided, they said that they weren't going to do mediation with us. Uh, I decided we decided to lock myself in and show the people out there what happens in compulsory purchase and show people what, what they've done. Any comments, discussion, questions for Barbara? I don't know your family, but I live about 10 minutes away, and I, I only saw a book on the I think that you should be put through as a bloody nightmare, and Glasgow City Council and anybody else involved should be ashamed of themselves. As I say, it's still, it's still been on the news. I've watched papers in Strasbourg, because when we went to court, you've got to understand, when you're going to the Sheriff Court, I was put in a big court. <coughs> And all these people in Glasgow were getting evicted for uh, not paying rent. It was terrible seeing people. It was unbelievable. And I was going to, to get evicted out of my home that I owned. And the sheriff, at the sheriff court, I said to the sheriff, excuse me, sir, do you know anything about CPO? They said no. The Glasgow City Council had sent a QC uh, up to represent them, and I had moved it. I had to represent myself. And I said, hey, do you know anything about compulsory purchase? He said, no. I said, well, why are you deciding on my case? He says, because that man there telling me what to do. I said, but he's for the council. He said, but he's telling me the laws. I went, when did you get my papers? He said, I got your papers half an hour before. I said, and you don't know anything. I said, I've said, I wrote to them and I've asked them for mediation and they've refused me. Uh, and he said, hey, well, do you think if you, if you, if I tell him to put you out, you'll be here tomorrow morning to put an appeal in? I say that up. And I had to go away the next morning, pay the money, put an appeal in, and that's the way it went. And every sheriff I went to was taking the council's side. They weren't willing to listen. That I was only wanting to go from one house to another house, like for like, yeah. and they weren't listening. They were all tenants, they get their in new houses, they get put in new 
new battlefront force. Mm -hmm. I was the only owner occupied. Uh, the rest were all tenants. And they stayed in the area? Uh -huh, they stayed in the area and they're in a front, nice wee battlefront rows, which they came in to me and they took all my details and they said uh, that I was left out to a four apartment I was to get, that was okay. The next day they appeared and they said, no, you're not getting a four apartment or any of our houses. You need to get your compensation to the council and move on. Just for some context, the, the, the rest of the tenements in that area were all owned by, at the time, Fenyu Housing Association. Um, I think the shop, the shop was the was with, with the Glasgow Housing Association, so it was mostly social tenants in, in the area. Margaret purchased some of the right to buy scheme and therefore wasn't eligible for you know, a, a new flat round the corner when the new things were built to, to rehouse the social tenants. So, those who were renting. This is more of a technical question about CPM, really. Um, about if you're a if you're a resident and you're not in social housing as such and you're into a private landlord, what what position are you in now? Because you know, like there's there's is that does it is it got the same rights as the person? You you wouldn't be compulsory purchased because you don't own the, the rights oh, yeah. to the to the flat. Um, if the, if your landlord was compulsory purchased, I guess you would just get turfed. Um, well you get rehoused. You, you, get, you might do, I don't know. Yeah. You call it a blanket. Yeah. You, 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 you get rehoused. You get rehoused. Okay. Okay. So you, yeah, you personally wouldn't be on the end of a CPO. Yeah. A CPO is to purchase your housing. Yeah. Your, your property. Yeah. I'm just wondering where, like, where people go. Like, you know, there's, there's the extent of these CPOs. And there's no, there's no research done on private councils to where people go. You know when it's situations where it's street after street? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Well, you know, what they do want to do? They moved the, the people out and they're away, away into all the different schemes. Every, everybody, get, they, moved, they started off in the flats and moved the people out to the flats. Then they started and they, they no. First of all, they spent money putting new windows in the flats, right. millions of yeah. pounds. Renovating the flats, putting millions of pounds, and then putting new roofs on the wee houses, spending money in the area. Then they started. After spending millions of pounds, they get put out. And that's what they did with our houses. Our, our buildings are all renovated. And we get new kitchens, new roof, new everything. The, the buildings are all solid. No, but it's got a point about how you get some buildings where those tenants are structurally the same. Mm -hmm. They'd be in the parks, which I know we're going to talk to us about. Um, fairly decently prior to that, they said the buildings were actually structurally the same. Mm -hmm. so the kind of decay you see there is obviously very, very deliberate disinvestment in order to create conditions for a regional in that area. And also to kind of justify it because when you stigmatise an area like that, yeah. you take lots of photographs of it and just go, it looks horrible, doesn't it? You know, that the case it does. So there's, no, I think that's, you know, because the George Redman is interested in the film clip and George Redman is saying the Margaret Humble is folded back on this development. <laughs> <laughs> but actually the city council is completely is underdeveloped, stigmatised mm -hmm. and disinvested in that area for probably a couple of decades yeah, or yeah. more, yeah. you know, in order to kind of create the conditions. So that's another really I see that as a very, very deliberate attack on people mm -hmm. who understand it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other points? Yeah. Who could have changed things for you at any point? What, what was the it's a good point where you went through all the other different organisations that you were dealing with. What, what was the decision? Going to the sheriff court to the sheriff court. Was it well? Was it the sheriff court? What was the? Uh, no. Do you think it was? Do you think it was already decided nothing was going to change? Yeah, that, what happened was when you get the CP, when you get the CPO right, there's you've got to get down to the right stages, right? Now the council, we should have had a public inquiry, and the council. There is an informal hearing. When you said the council, Margaret, who do you mean? Glasgow City Council. But I mean, there's all the different departments, is it? You know, well, we there, development we generation, development regeneration services it is. And all the stages before you get to the process, you're supposed to have a public inquiry and all your objections. We did that, we went to the meeting, and during the meeting, they decided they it was an informal hearing and they tried to change it to a public inquiry. Mm. And we were 
rating in the public inquiry comment and when during the hearing the the reporter he said hey, this is a public inquiry to the shop owners and I said excuse me sir it's just an informal hearing even the reporter didn't know it was just an informal hearing this is the way they go kind of a like backhanded doing all the stuff behind people's back and the reporter's decision was the Commonwealth Games was going to be for the good of the area and that was it. They didn't listen to any objections or nothing. And as I say, till this day we've still not even had the correct hearings or the correct procedure. And that's what they do in <coughs> compulsory purchase. They do it with everybody. Everybody in compulsory purchase does not get the correct procedure. It's the council that decide when you're going and even when they send you paperwork out for the paperwork and you contact them, you never get them, that's it. So they make you that you've not contacted them. But as I say, as long as you've got a paper trail, you know you've contacted them and that's what you've got to do. I, I was just going to make the point that actually sometimes they do negotiate from Charles Price, yes. for instance. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So it's actually worth having a look at that number crunch and things and posts are paid in the time campaign. There was a, a church across the road from it and it was sold, the Archdiocese had sold it to a developer for 700000 The developer got $1.7 million. Plus the council decided to give them a bit of land, but you know money's going to change when you change the land, which it didn't happen with me, but it did with this guy. He paid a pound for a bit of land. Twelve weeks down the line, the council decided they needed that land back and gave them a million pounds for it if they didn't trip out. I mean, the, bit, the bit of land for a million pounds has been given away free to Clyde Gateway. The other, the other bit of land was a £40,000 that was granted with developments and he went away with £5.6 million. And it wasn't, it wasn't massive, it was a, a piece of land. Charles Price, he went away with £17 million plus his back. But there's an investigation into that just now because his report, the Collier's report, just came to light. And the report for Collier's say it was to get under 15 million, but he didn't. He went away with seven, he went away with 20, just under 21 million. He went away with, so there has been a lot of stuff going on. Bearing in mind, this is land literally across the road from Margaret's house, and it's happening at the same time. Because exactly the five years that they never. So again, we have this structural injustice about council will negotiate with certain kinds of people, certain mm -hmm. and this distinct class aspect of this, um, and not negotiate with others. Well, maybe that's all, and you'll be able to tell easily from the market, easily from the market. Just to kind of answer the question of what could happen differently from a financial point of view, the house is valued by the district value. Now the district value I can only take the current value of that house and we'll see the condition of it. But what is entitled to be what's called a discretionary payment for rehousing or for your inconvenience or it's discretionary, it's up to his discretion. So the district value could have entirely changed this case from a financial point of view for the discretionary payment. The other thing that would have changed the case and this, speaking from my perspective as someone who was standing beside Margaret and uh, you know, help, um, but in a not very effective way, unfortunately, um, would have been a, a, someone with a legal brain or a, um, a, a good, good with the valuations to have known inside and out how this process worked. Um, but our experience has been solicitors don't know anything, it would seem, um, and, and don't want to touch CPO uh, cases with a bar collar, nor do surveyors. So, it's almost impossible to get you know the right kinds of experts on your side um, to help you. But a good legal brain at certain points, I reckon, would have shifted the nature of this case. Yeah. I know Margaret would have found this because I've been through a lot of similar things. They are totally different. Yeah. Uh, no housing, it was jobs related. But every professional or expert you come up against, whenever you, whatever stage you're at. They'll never criticise whoever they, has gone before kind of thing. Professionals and experts don't like to criticise each other. Even if they've made a hash it, none of them are to blame. Mm. Very true. Yeah. I think we've probably got time for maybe one more question or comment from the floor and then we should move on to yeah. part two. <laughs> yes? Uh, and I just wanted to, 
the four mentioned about the Scottish government offering mediation. I think mean, I just wondered if you could tell have you got any recourse to the Scottish government or how's they been involved in it? The Scottish government had come in to date that day and said that we were going to sit down. We went to Glasgow City Council and said, let's sit down at a table and we'll do mediation. And the phone call, my sister he said, that's okay, that's one of Market Jack's asked for. And within five minutes, his phone rang and the Glasgow City Council said, no, no mediation. We want them in. And that's what had happened to day one. They weren't really willing to sit down and negotiate with me at all. They were willing to sit down with all the big land developers to negotiate. Now, there were only five shop owners. No, there were six shop owners. The one was the local councillor's cousin, and he went away five, and the other five was me five. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's unbelievable. You know what I mean? One of the guys had his business bumped out down there. It's unbelievable. People wouldn't believe what had happened. One, one last comment. Um, did you ever get an estimate of how much the uh, cost of the eviction was? £50,000.